Dale Little here with Rescue American Ministries, and uh, we're in Second Peter, chapter two. We've covered verses one through four the last time, but we're going back up and w uh, with verse four this time uh, because it really fits with the rest of it <clears throat> as we get into it. Uh, but I did want to touch on it a little bit the last time. Uh, however, we'll pick back up, and so we'll start in verse four, go as far as we can. Uh, as far as time allows, it uh, may take us a couple more um, sessions to get through this. Peter didn't, didn't hold anything back as he was uh, writing uh, this letter to the church and uh, to the, the people that he was said like-minded, like himself. In other words, those that were in the faith. Um, <clears throat> and he talked about the, um, the false prophets and the the false teachers uh, that would come and, and that were already there. And so now he's talking about how God is going to judge them, and he will. Uh, he's judged them before. Uh, we saw where uh, Elijah went up on the Mount Carmel with, uh, what was it, 400 of them, I think. Uh, not sure if I have my figures right on that and looked at it lately, but uh, something like that, there's a large number of um uh, prophets of Baal there and one prophet of God and God showed who was in control God sent fire from heaven and licked up the sacrifice even after it had water poured all over it uh, these people that follow Satan these people that follow evil they, they follow their, their own idea of what God is they think they are following something that's got some power that's what they're hungry for they're uh, they have an obsession with power and uh, what allows them to do as they please, pretty much. And, you know, some people are allowed to do that for a while. Um, and the thing is, that comes to an end sooner or later. Every man on this planet has ever had that attitude. I can do what as I please and nobody can stop me. Guess what? There's not one of them around right now. They've all been stopped at some point. Doesn't matter what you think you got. You might go for a while. Yeah, you might be unstoppable for, stoppable for a short while. Only because God permits it. Well, why would God permit something like that? Now, we ask that all the time. Why is there evil in the world? <clears throat> why is there still evil? The main reason is that God is merciful. Uh, you say, well, you know, that's just a made-up excuse. Well, Satan's not merciful. Uh, if it's up to him, he'd go ahead and kill everybody, and that's his purpose. He says he's a murderer. Uh, he doesn't care anything about you. If he's allowing you to live, it's for his own personal purposes, not anything to do with you, just for a short while, and he'll let you go. He'll, he'll give you up. Uh, just like that. God is merciful. Not willing that any should perish, even the most wicked sometimes. And so he is merciful and gives opportunity, and they may wreak a lot of evil during that period while God is showing mercy to them. But God has shown mercy and waits, but sooner or later that mercy runs out. Now, the Bible says, you can say, well, God says his mercy endures forever. It does. But not for each individual. The individual that shuns that mercy, God's mercy will last on and on. But if a person shuns that mercy, then that mercy will cease at some point for that person. So sooner or later, they have to answer for what they've done in this life and how they've spit in the face of God pretty much shook their fist in his face, think that they're God, well, guess what? One day they're going to stand behind before him um, and they're going to be in the shape that Belshazzar was in when the handwriting came on the wall. The Bible says that uh, King Belshazzar had brought all these uh, utensils out of the temple that belonged into the temple of God 
And they'd take them and brought them into their temple. Now Nebuchadnezzar had never used them. He'd stored them. But Belshazzar brought them out to use them so he could make fun and say, you know, God's not going to do anything. I'll drink wine. We'll do what we want to. We'll show that this God of the Hebrews is nothing. And then the handwriting comes on the wall. The Bible says that Belshazzar's knees smoked together. And his loins were loosed. I think he I think his knees gave away. I think he went to his knees. I can't prove that, but when it says his loins gave way, the, you know, he didn't have anything left to stand with. So if he went to his knees, I'm pretty confident. And that's what you will do. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much power you think you've got. I don't care how many people you've got with you. One day you will stand before the Almighty God. And you'll give an account. And there'll be nothing you can do. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Whether you do it willingly or whether you do it because once you see the majesty, the holiness, that there really is a God an almighty, all-powerful God above anything that you can imagine that created the whole universe, you'll drop to your knees. So, Peter here, just like on the day of Pentecost, he didn't pull any punches. <laughs> all these times later, here it is, just about the time of his end. He's not changed. If anything, he's gotten more bold. I look back, it said uh, in chapter 1, um, they got the verse here. It says, I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus made clear to me. It's in verse 14. And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able to at any time to recall these things. So Peter knows his time is short. And like I say, if anything, he's got even more bold. Let's look and see what he has to say here. Talking about these false prophets, these people that stand against God. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell... And committed them to chains of gloomy darkness. We talked about that the last time. To be kept until judgment. Gloomy darkness. There'll be no partying. There's no partying going on now. And there'll be no partying later. If he did not spare the ancient world. But preserved Noah. A herald of righteousness with seven others. When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man lived among them day by day, day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. So let's stop right there for a little bit. Through verse 8. For God did not spare the angels when they sinned. Satan rebelled. Took a third of the angels with him. I wonder what he rebelled about. I know, you know, the, the simple answer is he's full of pride. And he wanted God's position. But what made him think that? And I don't know. I'm just throwing out a conjecture here. We talked about God's mercy a while ago. Maybe that's what Satan was upset about. He might have been upset when, <laughs> um, I, I don't know when this fall took place. There's different thoughts on it, different time. But who knows? It had to be before the Garden of Eden that he tempted Adam and Eve there. Um, but maybe that even added to his disdain for God. 
because God forgave them. He probably said, you know, God, you're going to destroy these people. I just enticed them. They didn't want to took it. You know, I didn't make them take it. I just kind of give them an option there. And look, look what they did in your face. Just they disobeyed you. Now, I don't know about that. But it could be that he even made him more angry. God, you know, Satan doesn't show any mercy. He's not going to show you any mercy. He'll take you and use you and throw you away when he's finished. They were committed to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. There's a judgment day coming yet. There's still a judgment day that will come. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald her of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Now people talk about the flood today, and uh, you, you, you hear some of these secular um, people that think they won't talk about the Bible if they don't know anything about the Bible. They know that there's a little bit about this, uh, what is the Epic of Gilgamesh, that also has a story in it about the flood. And Gilgamesh, I believe it was Nimrod. I believe that's who Gilgamesh was. You know, the, the why does it use the name Gilgamesh? Well, you know, to Tower of Babel, the, the language was confounded. And so people went by one name one time, and, and, and a lot of these false gods and things even were known by one name, and then they got confounded language. So other people called them by another name because they didn't use that language anymore. But at any rate, I believe that's who Nimrod was. I, I think that's who uh, Gilgamesh was in history. Uh, now people question where they, they say that's a myth too, and what he wrote, wrote is a myth. You got two camps there, you know, some take it as a myth, and no it is, of course they claim it's a myth and the Bible's a myth. Then you got others that claim that Gilgamesh's story maybe is true. But Gilgamesh pictured God as being the, the bad guy. And Satan as being the good guy. Um, so you see where Nimrod was at and God confounded the language he dispersed them throughout the earth because they was trying to build a shoot tower and uh, um, Nimrod was a builder of cities wanted people all in these big cities where he could control them just like today you got a lot of people that's what they want these globalists they want people where they can be more controlled and God said, no, God's not a globalist. God is a nationalist. He dispersed people with different languages and caused them to have different nationalities, at least until he comes and sets up his kingdom. Uh, and the Bible seems to indicate that those nations will still be there. There will still be nations that will bring in to worship him. So, um, People talk about people that are nationalist. Uh, just because some people have misused that, like Hitler uh, and others, that doesn't mean that it's wrong because they have misused it. And it's intent. But nationalism itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, that you're proud of your country. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, as long as you still got an eye to see that it's evil within it and speak out against it. So, uh, Gilgamesh claimed that he was the only one that survived the flood. But actually, if that was Nimrod, the Nimrod didn't survive the flood. He was a grandson, excuse me, I think a great grandson of Noah. In verse 6, it talks about turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. He condemned them to extinction, make, extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, notice that he called right, uh, Lot a righteous man. A lot of people think, well, because Lot took off and went towards Sodom and Gomorrah and stayed there, he was lost as could be. And that's what they say about a lot of people today. 
because certain people uh, stray away for a little while or either, uh, you know, but God even may send some. Now, he didn't send Lot that way. That Lot, Lot was made his choice because it grassy area down there looked luscious and his cattle could get fat and he could become rich. That's what he was looking at. But sometimes God sends a person off to a place like that to be a missionary or whatever. And people say, well, well what's he doing down there at the bar? Remember Jerry Falwell talking. Now, you know, I'm not promoting this. A person that does anything like this needs to be very mature and very careful. But Jerry Falwell said when he went to, into an eating establishment, if they had a bar in there, he always went, or at least usually went and sat with the bar and struck up a conversation with the uh, people at the bar there and, and witnessed Christ to them. And like I say, if you do that, you need to be careful. I, I've never, <laughs> I don't usually do that. I have done some other things that I'm sure I would have been criticized if other people had known about it at the time. I, years ago, used to go on New Year's, and some people knew about that. It's been a long time ago. On uh, what we called um, watch night service on New Year's Eve, a lot of churches get together and go to one church, have what's called a watch night service as the New Year came in. I'm not criti- I'm not critical of that, but I said, you know what? While we're in there doing that, people are just running in now that liquor store uptown, and so I decided I was going up there and just hand out tracks. I tried to be discreet about it, not that I was scared, but I, I wanted to hand out as many tracks as I could. So therefore, I did not stand at the door trying to catch people as they went in to prevent them because I knew that I would soon be ushered away. So I went around the corner, and and what I did is I called them as they came out and talked to them and witnessed to them about Christ and told them there's something better than what they had in their hand there. Now, a lot of people, I'm sure, maybe spotted me up there. Who knows? There might have been some rumors. I said, I know of. I said, I saw Dale Little up at the liquor store. You'd be careful about some, you know, make sure we know what we're talking about. I also used to, in more recent, not too long before I came to Romania, they had a, um, what do they call it, um, where different people get up and sing, I forget the term right now, but at a uh, local local bar there in, uh, in the Hickory area, <clears throat> in Hickory. Um, it was an eating established actually, and but they had a bar, um, and uh, they had allowed people to you know come in, get up and sing, and they was just really two main groups, basically myself and then another group that kind of got it up and started it, and you know one would sing a while and the other, and so what I did is I took me a few oldie songs from the sixties and seventies. Uh, that didn't have a, you know, wicked message in it of some kind, you know, cheating and drinking. And then I took some gospel music and I kind of mixed it back and forth. And I'm sure there's people. I took someone with me most of the time when I could, uh, just to verify, you know, what I was doing. I wasn't there doing anything inappropriate. Wasn't drinking while I was there. But you know what? I don't know how much that reached people, but I had a couple of people thank me, and I had one of the waitresses thank me one time. You know, she probably didn't, if she worked on Sunday, and uh, very good chance she didn't get to church very often. And so she appreciated what I was doing. And I, I felt led of the Lord to do that. It wasn't just something I just decided, well, I wanted to do. Uh, so, you know, God calls us places like that. Didn't mean to get off on that too much, but, you know, that's uh, we need to be careful um, about starting rumors just because we saw something that when we don't know the whole story. Um, so, you 
lot. My point was, that's where I got going with that. Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he shouldn't have been there, but yet God said he was a righteous man. He kept his righteousness, even though he was in Sodom and Gomorrah. And God saw fit to bring him, he and his family out before he destroyed the city, as Abraham had prayed and asked God to. But while he was there, and this is, let me tell you, let me warn you. When you do something like this, and intentionally go after the, the big money, you know, this, something that's good. I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong. But if you aren't careful and you go in the wrong direction. Yeah, he was still righteous, but notice what it said. Greatly, um, he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. He had to put up all that wickedness around him. And horrible, a horrible wickedness. I know it was more than just inhospitality, like some people spreading a lie that that's what it was all about. No, they weren't just inhospitable. They were wicked, wicked, wicked. God haters. Verse 8, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. And the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the right, unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So not only does it say that uh, God knows how to keep the ungodly under judgment, he knows how to deliver the righteous. Thank God he does. I've said this, I, I just, I, and I will keep saying it. Philippians 1 6, he that began a good work in you will uh, keep it and continue until that day. And I've said often, if I started, I may not keep it. <clears throat> it may not last. I didn't start it. God did. And so God knows how to keep. People criticize because I believe. You can call it what you want to. I don't care if you call it eternal security. Um, um, <clears throat> once saved, always saved. Uh, call it what you want to. I call it eternal life. That's what the Bible calls it. Eternal life without beginning, without end. The life that God put into me the day I got saved was His life. Jesus Christ came into my heart. That's why it's without beginning. And it'll be without end. So... If you want to call it, you know, make fun of it or, or criticize it, ridicule it, whatever you want to do. If you started your salvation, if you're the one that got it started, then you're in trouble. It's not going to last. Um, you, you, you can't make it last. God's the only one can do that. God's the only one that can start that. He's the only one that can you keep it. And he's the only one that can finish it. Let's put it that way. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Clear enough. I don't say I could be any more clear. Verse 10, and especially those who indulge in the lust. Talking about those unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling Passion and despise authority. I've never seen a day when people despise authority like they do. Even Christians have a rebellious nature in them these days, it seems like. 
I, I don't want to get off on that. A lot of people take up some causes. They don't have time to go out and spread the gospel that much. I mean, I'm not saying they don't. It seems like most of the time is hammering on things they don't like having to do, self-checkout, things like that, mask. Yeah, I said it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know what it's all about. Don't, you know, don't tell me, well, you know, this is, you know what they're doing? They're trying to control us. Yes, I know that. I know that, but uh, what do you, is the point, I, I think the point is, in other words, the line, in other words, the line that you say you're not going to cross or they're not going to cross, to me it may be one place for you, it may be somewhere else, a little bit different, it may not be all exactly the same, but there should be a point, if we're going to preserve our liberty, we're going to have to take a stand at some point. Now that point may not always be the same. Everybody might not agree on where that point should be. But I think it's coming. I, in my opinion, I'm not saying everybody else has to agree with this. And that's what comes to the problem is that when we start talking about masks, we start talking about the virus and we, or the, uh, um, uh, the vaccine, things like that. We get so dogmatic. You know, if you don't agree with me, then you're just not, you're with the other side or something. No. It may just be we've drawn our line just a little bit over, a little bit further, and you drew your line. And sometimes that's the case. I know that's my case a lot of times. I, I look at what people are kind of demanding that this is it. And for me, it's not. It may be a little further over. And, um, but that's kind of different thing there sometimes uh, nevertheless there does enter in I'm not saying people that, that do that are concerned because I believe that it's coming when they talk about going door to door I believe that's maybe a time to say no you're not coming in my house and we stand our ground don't let them intimidate you I mean, they're going to haul us all off to jail? I mean, they may try. I don't know. Um, but the point I'm getting at is there's a rebellious nature in man. Let, let me just put it this way. I'm not going to dictate and say this is the point. Uh, this is right as far as masks and vaccines you, you know, you can go this far, but not that far. Uh, forget about all that. Let me just say this. Let us examine ourselves. Examine yourself. Not me. I, I'm, it's not up to me to examine you. It's not up to you to examine me. Examine ourselves. Just make sure that there's not that spirit of rebellion in there. That's kind of creeped in. And if not, if you're clear of that, then praise God. Take your stand. But if there's a rebellious, rebellious in that, a spirit in there somewhere, then you might back up and get that taken care of first and then come back into the fray, whatever. Uh, and we do have, we are in spiritual warfare than have been from the beginning. Okay, let me hurry on a little bit. We're not going to get far. Um, it says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, especially those who indulge in the lust of violent passions and despise authority. Um, behold, excuse me, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, it's Peter's words, creatures of instinct born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, 
will also be destroyed in their destruction. And we'll stop right there. And we may again back up a little bit and cover that a little more in depth when we come back. Uh, but we've gone through verse 12, basically, and like I said, we may back up and start from there, building on the next lesson. Bold and willful. Yeah, they, they don't tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. But notice this, angels, though greater in might and power, you understand that? You understand that angels are greater in might and power than you and I? I, I always had a problem with that song that used to be out years ago. Of course, it's still around, but I hadn't heard it a lot lately. We talk about when you get to heaven, you're going to say, Angel, step back. Not me. <laughs> you, you know, if they won't step back voluntarily, they probably should. But that's a little bit arrogant there, I think. Angel, step back. You know, I'm here now. Well, I, I understand we're going to be a different situation once we get to heaven. But right now, we're a little bit lower than the angels. But they, even the angels, did not blame, bring blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. And you got people today say, well, just, um, what do they say, um, proclaim. Command these people these angels, and, and it'll be done. Just, you know, you got power of the tongue. Well, you got power of the tongue. You got power to destroy people, things like that. You've got power to praise people. But you don't have power to, within yourself, within your tongue, to defeat Satan, to defeat these evil people, uh, unless that tongue is quoting from right in here somewhere, speaking the word of God. And then it's not your tongue that's powerful. It's the word. So you, you know, if you feel better, boy, I got power, you know. But be careful again that you're not all puffed up because you've got what you think, you know, God might cut you down a little bit or allow you to be cut down. So it's better to let him lift you up. Uh, I mean, that's what the Bible says. You know, they didn't, people didn't bring railing accusation. Even the angels didn't bring railing accusations about these others. Even the body of Moses, I think that's Jude. I, don't, uh, I think that's where he talked about that, you know, when they argued over the body of Moses, that even Michael the angel didn't, um, I guess, condemn, so to speak, Satan over the body of um, Moses. But he didn't let him have it. But he called on God. He let God <laughs> straighten Satan out. So, God gives us power. That's true. Uh, but it's his power. We need to be in his will. Okay. We've gone on. We need to get, to get out of here, and uh, we'll pick back up on the next lesson. Dale Little here with the Rescue American Ministries. Here, uh, been here in the last two and a half years. Don't know how much longer we'll be here. Been testing to Romania.